Hello. <laughs> All right, I think we uh, we've hit eleven o'clock. So, uh, so first of all, thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is my talk, first pass, final pass, which is going to be about animating when you don't have very much time, um, and a lot of related subjects. So, uh, right. So first of all, who who is this guy standing at the front? Um, my name is Tim Dawson. I have uh, started started working as an animator in two thousand and three. Uh, as a junior cinematic animator, and uh, since then have worked at a number of companies in Australia, uh, primarily as an animator, technical animator um, in that area, until 2013 when I decided to go on my own way, quit my job, and start a indie company and make the game a sole Android Cactus. And that's what I've been doing ever since, luckily enough. Um, and that's, that's my background, that's, that's where a lot of this stuff has kind of been learned over. Uh, just yep, short short version of my ship titles. I started started back on Ratbag with uh, Dukes of Hazard, <laughs> and um, yeah, continue through to uh, so Android Cactus, which you know, last game, and um, and a bunch of cancelled stuff, which unfortunately is where a lot of this formulative stuff uh, was learnt from. But you know, it's all lost to history because of how companies work. What I want to cover in this talk is going to be less about nitty gritty animation and more about, I guess, the philosophy of uh, how I approach animation and what I think is important or what I've come to discover is important over my career so far. And I'm hoping that will be kind of interesting and, hope, and also inspiring um, and maybe help you with your own kind of uh, thought process on animation. I tend to take a very inclusive approach to animation. I think it's not about being told the right way to animate, it's about being exposed to as many ideas as possible and being able to pull the right ones out when you need them at the time. And so this is going to be a part of my approach. Take what you can or what you want and throw back what you don't. But yeah, so hopefully there'll be something interesting in there. So one of the formulative ideas of this talk actually came from when I was working at Pandemic. I was working on some animations for uh, a faction of enemies that would jump across rooftops and they would move in a they would move with parkour so they would be oops, they would be jumping and dive rolling across rooftops leaping across gaps and when i was working on the animation set i had them all set up i had run cycles i had jump cycles i had climbing down ladders i had all these things set up and i'd set them up in editor so that they could be strung together and run across a, a rooftop so i could see what they looked like and a producer saw this on my screen and said this looks great please show this at the Friday meeting and I did and the whole team looked at it and I got lots of compliments and people were really excited and they're like this is amazing this looks incredible and when I got back to my desk and inspected the animations properly I realized they were terrible terrible animations they were just objectively bad I had legs flipping inside out I had feet angling the wrong way this was somewhere between blocking and first pass these animations were not ready to go out yet no one had noticed any of this I hadn't noticed any of this when I saw it on the screen and it got me thinking about like maybe what really matters about the animation is not so much the kind of polishing and fixing things but the heart of the animation you know the stuff that actually communicates to people so in that spirit um, preparing for this talk I was I did a quick animation of a guy jumping across the rooftop and I just wanted you to have a quick look at this and think what do you see when you see this like if you <laughs> it looks a bit stilted from here but um, the point is, it's like he leaps, so he's leaping across the rooftop, he's landing, and it's at first blush, if you saw this in a, if you saw this in a game, it probably wouldn't destroy your suspension of disbelief. If you, if you were running after a character and he leapt across a, uh, across a building, you'd say, yep, there he goes, he landed, he rolled, he kept going. Um, and it kind, of, it kind of gets away with it in some ways. If we take a little closer look at it, the animation's made out of um, 13 keyframes with one repeating keyframe at the end. The keyframes are in red. That's all there is to it. Everything else is just a tween. Absolutely no work done on it. You can see the feet go through the ground, the arms go through the ground. There's a momentum uh, shift on the landing. It's just like, it's not a great animation. It's, it's rough. But the important thing, and the thing that I was happy about with this, is it captures the general energy and the feeling of leaping across a building. And this is not a bad place to start from especially if you're trying to get something in and playable in your, in your game very, very quickly. 
And that kind of comes back to the single biggest thing that I worry about with animation is the sense of weight. When you're animating, the best thing you can, the best thing you can achieve is if you look at the animation and you believe the character and the objects weigh, as, weigh an appropriate amount. Because weight kind of controls everything. It's inertia, it's, it's pacing, it's overshoot. All of, a lot of principles in animation come out of weight. And weight is ultimately what makes something believable. Um, if you have a, a stack of boxes falling down, a physics simulation makes that look realistic because we, it fools in a way that mimics what we expect things to do in real life. But when it comes to character animation, it's people's energy that we identify as making it look conscious or look like a human. So it's that weight, uh, weight to make things look real and energy to make things look alive, which I thought was kind of the most guiding principles of animation for me. And it's useful to consider some bio, uh, biomechanics at times as well, that we're effectively a skeleton rigged together with a bunch of meat being pulled around by cables that are also made of meat. Um, muscles are so interesting, they only contract. All of our motion is basically, we, you know, one, one muscle pulls another part and pulls us around. And everything is, everything is, by, that, uh, is by that mechanism. And if you think about it, that's a very, that feels like a very chaotic ad hoc mechanism. But obviously, we've been using it for our entire lives. And some of us have become very, very precise at moving this bone skeleton full of meat to move in very precise ways. Uh, these animations at the bottom here was just uh, kind of on the topic of weight. So you can imagine this first animation, it looks like uh, they all start, in the, start and end in the same f uh, frame and the ball falls at the same rate. In the first animation, you would assume the ball is made of styrofoam or something, something that has no weight. Um, and in the second one, imagine it's either, it's like it's heavier, maybe not quite a shot put ball, but somewhere like maybe it's full of something solid. And you can, it's kind of, it's an exercise to the, to the viewer, how heavy you think the ball is versus how strong or how prepared you think the catcher is. Um, is the person in the middle one just taking the weight? Are they, are they tanking, the, tanking the hit and, and recovering quickly? Or is it a heavier ball in the third one? But in either way, it's communicating something. And it's kind of really important to trying to convey something about the ball physically and also the character that's catching it, their strength and their ability. So basically, human motion is a contradiction. We have these two, si two sides of things. On one hand, we're a skeleton being yanked around by tendons. On the other hand, we have uh, brains and complex nervous systems that are able to control us very precisely. On one hand, we're controlling, where we anticipate, where we can be experts. On the other hand, we can panic, we can flail, we can fall over, we can not know what we're doing. And animation is, is always going to sit somewhere on this kind of continuum. continuum. And to me, that's really fascinating and also really essential for building an animation. You always want to kind of know where on this scale are you sitting, somewhere between chaos and order. Um, and so, yeah, we're physical creatures. We have physical bodies that move. We have inertia. We have weight. But we're not ragdolls. We are controlled. And some of the, some of the people that we find the most interesting to look at are um, practicing that control to a very high degree. Uh, choreographed dance, dance routines, martial artists. Uh, so much of uh, martial artist uh, practice stuff is about being able to precisely control where you stop, like a hard stop. That's actually quite difficult to like snap a pose and hold it with no overshoot or anything else. It requires a lot of control, like all these muscles are working back and forth. And that's what you get for free if you don't adjust your curves and do a bad animation. But in real life, that's actually a feat of expertise. That, and it's, uh, it's kind of that gets back to that paradox. Um, a lot of the time, the control that a character shows, how much do they flail their arms when they jump off a, off a ledge, tells you what that character thinks of the act of jumping off that ledge. Um, so a character that's pinwheeling their legs looks like they're more out of control and more unhappy with jumping off a ledge than someone who does it you know, very precisely and hits the ground and rolls in a very precise way. You might assume that person is a special ops or has trained for a long time or is a gymnast or something versus uh, you know, your kind of uncharted style, whoa, everything's breaking and the ledge fell apart kind of chaos. And it's, that seems like a, you know, it's an either or thing, but it's super important to consider when you're animating because you should know who is this character, what, you know, are they prepared for this, 
or are they not? And that ties directly into setting the keyframes and making the animation work. Um, as a kind of an aside, I hope, like, I'm assuming the animators in the audience uh, appreciate uh, inverse kinematics versus uh, forwards kinematics. So, you know, you can control the movement of a uh, movement of an end effector versus controlling the kind of limbs directly. And it's interesting that when we're when we're focused on something, when we're trying to achieve a particular outcome, our motion tends to resemble IK movement. So I'll move my hand directly to the glass. But if I was trying to catch my balance on the edge of something, I'm going to resemble uh, FK movement. And it's kind of it's not a one for one, but it's kind of interesting how all of these systems tie back together. And also chaos is good. Um, so this is and so keeping on this concept of weight, uh, it's really important to know your physics or understand your physics uh, when you're working on, especially a big, big animation like uh, someone jumping up and kickboxing a helicopter or like the Incredible Hulk leaping across a building, it's really important to understand what forces are you suggesting are happening here? Because, you know, we're really sensitive to physics for the most part. We can tell if something is moving unnaturally or um, unconvincingly. And it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's really, worth, it's really worth respecting. So if you imagine a character that's going to leap across a building, they're going to kick off the ground but the way they're going to do that is at that moment of leaving the ground, they're going to be moving upwards and forwards as fast as they will ever in that sequence because that's all the energy they've got. Uh, the moment they leave the ground, uh, drag, which is uh, wind resistance in, in most cases, it, or air resistance, is going to start slowing them down. Drag slows you down the faster you move, roughly speaking. Don't call me out on this, physicist. But the point is you, you start off and you'll slow down the rate of it is going to decrease the most at the start and ease off as you go, which means that in that initial, initial kick off the ground, you're going to be moving the fastest and you're only going to get slower forwards and upwards. Um, as well as that, gravity, which most of us are much more familiar with for animation, is going to, is going to push you straight down. So as you're moving upwards, you're going to have gravity take off the motion immediately in a very predictable acceleration curve, which is you know, like uh, 9.81 meters per second per second. Uh, but the, the important thing is that's going to look like a, a parabola, right? Like you're going to have this, this nice curve where it goes up, slows down, and starts coming down again. That's your, that's your up and down curve. Versus going forwards, it's going to be forwards, and it's going to slow down a little bit. But it doesn't have to taper off, because you can imagine there's a lot of energy there. And then when the character hits the ground, something has to happen with that energy. Something has to happen with that inertia. In a parkour roll, they can roll it out and continue the forwards motion. If they hit the ground, you expect, if it's Hulk, you expect the, the ground to crack. Um, or the character to really like, crouch down and, and absorb the impact with their own body. So that, uh, that energy has to go somewhere. And if it doesn't go somewhere, it looks wrong. You imagine a character just landing on the ground and just walking away. You're just everything in your brain is going to scream, that doesn't look right. And so it's like nailing this kind of stuff makes a character look like they have weight, makes a character look like they're alive, and is kind of fundamental to selling a realistic performance. However, we don't actually care about the physics. Don't work it out ever. Uh, there are so many variables, it doesn't even matter. Terminal velocity, which is a product of drag versus gravity, right? can vary depending on how you hold your body. You know, skydivers can pin drop to go faster, then put their arms out to slow down. It's like, it's all, there's no, re there's no reason to kind of figure out what the actual thing is. Technically, you should never be able to fall faster than gravity or accelerate faster than gravity. But if you make a character accelerate faster than gravity, it looks fine, as long as you're following that general curve. Because realistically, you don't know if gravity is wrong unless you know, one, the gravity, because you could be an alien planet, right? to the mass of the object, no, not the mass of the object, that doesn't matter, scale of the object, because that affects things. So the point is, we're not sensitive to the exact numbers, we're sensitive to the general concept. So if you get it to feel right, if you get it to look right, if you get the curve to follow the roughly the right shape, it reads as correct. And the rest of it, we can have a bit more fun with it. Um, yeah, and there's the example of Superman struggling to stop a train and then stopping, st uh, struggling to stop a meteor. It's like there's a bit of difference in mass there, what's going on. 
But the point is, all we want is the feeling that we're tying into something real. Uh, it would feel weird to see it would be weird, weird, weird to see something else. The second thing, obviously timing is also part of weight. Um, I didn't mention it before, but that ca character catching the ball, you could actually change what, how heavy the ball looked by changing the timing of the ball catch. So the character that like just flinched, if the flinch was faster but the recovery was slower, it would read as a heavier impact versus making the flinch take longer and the recovery faster would make it look like a lighter object. It's kind of really interesting that way. But the other role that uh, timing plays in animations is uh, well, performance, basically. It communicates a lot. Uh, good animation has a rhythm. Animation, you know, characters can move quickly, characters can move slowly. When you're talking about animation curves, we have ease out, ease in, uh, jolts. You know, it's, we have a range of motion when we're working on an animation tool. But just, just generally, when we're planning out a performance, a character can suddenly move into an action and then take their time to recover. Or they can, you know, vice versa, and in this example at the bottom here, this is just a character drawing a sword. It was the simplest thing I could think of. And I just timed it out a couple of different ways just to show what, uh, what, it, could, uh, yeah, what it could look like. And the interesting thing is like, imagine a character in a video game performing this very simple action and whether, how you would react or what you would perceive to be the character's motivation or what the character's doing in each case. Uh, you know, the, the, set, the, the second one is kind of the, the first one is like a linear key, basically. Second one is, uh, is a bit more of a, a standard. If I didn't know what I was doing, it's just a nice, he's drawing a sword. Third one, this is a kind of like a, there's a hesitation or a flourish or a kind of, they're, they're reacting, but they're calming down during it. And it's like, it's a very simple motion. There's not very much going on, but there's something being communicated there. And that communication, you should be putting into your animation because if you're not, you're missing a huge trick. And something that a lot of people make the mistake of is not using enough timing differences in their animation. Like, you should have sudden mo motion, uh, sudden moments of movement followed by sudden mo moments of stillness. And you can think, of, they're not random, you can think about what is the character thinking? Uh, they go from panic to recovery, they go from what's going on to okay, I'm in control now. Or they go everything's fine to what was that, you know. All of these things are communicating things in a very direct way. And if you're not making use of them, you're basically trying to animate with a hand tied behind your back. And so it's like really useful to go in from the planning stage knowing what the motivation and what you're expecting to get out of timing. And the experimentation is actually super important. A lot of the times I find I'm working, I'm working on animation one way and I go, well, what would it look like if that part was really, really fast and the other part was really, really slow? And you try it and you go, oh, actually, that's, that works better. Like, my original plan was this, but when I got to it, it turned out that I was wrong. And those iterations is what helps you build up, basically, your eye, your animat animator eye, and helps you make better animations in future. So the next part is getting into how animations tie into gameplay. Um, obviously, I'm a gameplay animator, so I tend to focus on how things affect the, the final product. Uh, but, of, but if you're animating on a, um, a TV show or something like that, it just becomes the story intent. You know, there's always, there's a, your animation's always in service of something. It's very rare that you're just animating something for the fun of it. Um, completely for the fun of it. It should be fun. But uh, in gameplay, you always have some purpose that the animation is fulfilling. And understanding what that purpose is, is probably the number one time-saving tip for animating on, you know, when, when you don't have much time because it prevents rework. Or it doesn't prevent rework, but it minimizes rework and it makes rework so much more comfortable. Uh, the better you understand what the animation is for, the more likely you're gonna get something very close in the first time, and then you can iterate closer to what the game needs. Because that's the thing a lot of people often miss in game development, is it's not about checking off tasks, it's about fulfilling some sort of nebulous design goal. And so you might animate completely to spec. You might you might produce an animation that fits the game designer's vision 100%, and then the game designer might realize their vision needs to be adjusted. That's not a failure on the game, de game designer's part, that's game development, that's iteration. And the fact that you can get there faster means that the game will be better. And the biggest trick of animation is that if it supports the game, if the game is good, people will see the animation is better. So everybody wins, and it's one of those things where you absolutely want to support gameplay 
you absolutely want to understand the intent because it's just, it's, a, it's faster and you'll get a better result and people will be much happy to say, I love this game and the animation was good, it was excellent. And uh, speaking of focus, uh, a lot of the time, this is, this is true in all animation, but in gameplay animation, um, the you often think about where is the focus in the animation. If a character is drawing back a punch, in that moment of drawing back uh, their hand, their, their limb, what they're going to strike with becomes the focus. You want people to understand what they're going to do with it. Imagine a character has a giant glowing sword, they pull the sword back and they're about to do a, a fiery swing. You want, the, you want the player to understand that their sword is the most important part. If they're doing something funny with their leg, it's drawing attention away from what matters. So you actually want to be very conscious about where the focus of the animation is. Or imagine a character with a giant warhammer and they strike the ground and they send a shockwave uh, rippling forwards to take out the enemies. Um, at that moment of striking the ground, the character stops being the point of focus and the shockwave moving forwards becomes the most important part of the game. At that point, if you're spending all your time trying to animate the guy with the hammer reacting really nicely to hitting the ground, like maybe, like, you know, oh, he's reacting and he's wiping his brow and he's doing something else, it's like, that's actually, not only are you harming the game, you're wasting time because no one wants to look at that part. And if they do look at the guy reacting to hitting the ground, it's actually taking away from what's going on. And again, this is all about animating effectively and quickly. You don't want to put detail where detail shouldn't be. And ultimately, that lets you save your energy for the cool stuff. And that's another thing about what animating quickly should be. Like, make sure you know which animations are going to be the most impressive and which ones don't have to be the most impressive and don't get them mixed up. So on the, continuing on the theme of uh, gameplay animation in particular, this is, a, this is a huge one for me, is a lot of animators I've worked with have a tendency to think that their artistic job stops at the uh, animation program. That once they see something working in, in their viewport, then it's, they, they tune that and that's, that's what they're getting. But ultimately, animation in games is the result of what you get on screen. It's everything. It's transitions, it's implementation. And if you're not caring about how your animations transition, you're sort of only doing half the job. Uh, most people can probably remember playing a game where there's a perfectly serviceable idle animation, a perfectly serviceable walking animation, and something feels weird when they switch between the two. Um, and that's, that's kind of the problem, right? Like, that animation gets seen a lot because they respond to, that, that's what happens when the player plays with the game, is they're triggering these transitions. And if you have an animation system where if your character, if you're constantly pushing forwards on the stick, the character will um, awkwardly transition between two states. That's your animation. Um, and just like timing in general, transitions can have, a, have their own language. Uh, generally, a fast transition is really good for responsiveness. So you can imagine a game like Street Fighter and you do a, a jab punch. You don't have a transition. You just snap into that pose because like, that's all that matters. We're just, we're, just getting, we're just getting the fist out there. Um, and then when it comes back in, it can transition a little bit smoothly back into its idle pose so that it feels a bit smoother. But it's, it's knowing you're going to use both and you're going to use them all across the game. And they matter. Um, and for instance, in this little looping animation, um, there's a couple of examples here. The first one is the wall jump. Uh, when, when the character hits the, hits the wall and jumps again, they actually immediately snap into their wall pose animation even if they haven't had enough time to blend into it because I need that transition out into the jump animation. The jump animation doesn't even have a jump, it's just straight into that upright pose because I use the transition to, to get from whatever pose you're in into the jump pose in like one or two frames because it feels snappier. If I animated the actual leap off the ground, all I'd be doing is stealing frames that the character could be leaping into the air and that would feel less responsive and ultimately worse as a game even if it doesn't look as great in a still animation. Uh, the second one is the landing animation. There is a full landing animation where the character lands on the ground and recovers into the idle animation, but it's cancelled out of, even in the case of the idle animation, very quickly, because if the character starts moving during that recovery into idle, it means it can cross-blend into the run animation and it looks okay. Um, the alternative approach is to have variance, and so I could have a 
blend into idle and a blend into run. But that, that transitioning between blend from idle to, sorry, uh, blend, blending from landing to idle, landing to run, would look jankier than just having a nice transition that works with both. And so sometimes simplifying things keeps your motion intact better than having a huge amount of authored animations. And so basically transitioning and understanding how animation uh, blend states work is very much worth your time as an animator, especially if you're trying to get good results in a budget. So speaking of animation on a budget, doing full facial animation. Um, so yeah, in, in Cactus, it was, uh, in, in a cylindro Cactus, I want, it was very important for me to have some cutscenes. And it was kind of nice because it meant I got, I got to come back to animating cinematics, which is you know, where I started. And, um, but the rules I was working to to make sure that I could actually pull this off was to use as, least facial bone, uh, as few facial bones as possible. Uh, I'm a big fan of this in general, actually. Like, whenever you're building a rig, use as least controls as you think you need. Um, any controls that are just, like, nice to have are basically albatrosses around your neck when you get into production. It's, like, you'd rather, you'd rather not have the button there than, like, only use it occasionally. And um, in facial animation, it's, like, I've, I've worked in projects where we had a 90-bone face rig, which sounds great. You can have all this articulation, but, like, Unless you have the time to do that articulation, it's just a massive time sink and a potentially going to make the uh, end result look worse. Um, I feel like I get an acceptable result with my tiny minimal bone uh, rig, and I'm happy with that. And I was able to do that, match that quality across the whole game, and it was a very good trade-off. Um, personally, I always try to focus on making the facial bones control as much of the face as possible. If you look at the wireframe version, uh, you can see Cactus here, when she's moving her um, upper mouth controls, it's also pulling out her nose. And you can also see it's affecting the vertices all the way up the cheek, basically to the edge of the face. So it means whatever controls I'm moving, I'm getting some secondary and some movement, which is mimics el elasticity and kind of just, I don't know, it, especially for a cartoon style character, and I think honestly for a realistic character, it just helps a little bit and it's, it's a good time saving tip. And uh, for the yeah for the cutscenes, I generally always use a uh, look at target for the eye, the eyes, which is interesting because when uh, characters move their eyes, they tend to well, characters human beings move move their move their eye line. We tend to focus on one area, and we don't move our eyes smoothly. We flick them between focus points. So in general, our eyes are always locked on some sort of subject, and even if we move our head around, our eyes are continuing to look where they are. And so you kind of get that for free with an eye look at. And it's a good little tip. Um, I also like uh, to constrain cameras to the character's face. This is an example on the, the side here. So that way you can animate facial animation irrespective of body animation. Um, I've seen other workflows where people like will turn off the animation layer on a character and that you can do the same thing. This is a bit nicer because you get keep everything in context. Um, one tip I did find was I reduce the uh, camera draw, uh, what's it called, uh, falls from culling, really, really low. So you can see in this example, um, the second character shows up, but she's clipped out as she comes closer because um, I'm clipping it right down to the face thing. And that way I, I avoid cases where a character is close to another character and you see the back of the head in this camera and it just kind of clips it out. But either way, it just, ma it just makes it really easy to focus on the facial animation while still having the full body animation and the full posing and, and everything else kind of in the same scene. Um, the other one, since again, topic is getting stuff done quickly, is once I finish an uh, anim animation pass and I'm at a point where I can kind of accept it, uh, I'll often go through and put automatic curves on or um, depends on your animation program, but set the curves to basically have a little bit of overshoot. And so you can see, if you look really closely, you can see some of these curves where there's two curves, uh, two points that are the same level, and there's a bow between them, and that's just the overshoot happening. And what that gives you in, in practice is just like a character moves their eyebrow up, it continues moving up, and it comes back down. And it just it's you know subtle motion. You obviously have to control that to make sure it doesn't go out of control. And the big thing is anything that has a limit, such as jaw bones and eyeball, uh, eyelid bones you then need to clamp off to make sure they don't go past zero, because otherwise you get creepy, weird people that inject their 
drawers into their own noses. Um, but for the most part, it's a good way of adding a little bit of polish quite quickly on the end without having to go in and like hand key all the overshoot. Uh, and so with that, all that, this is a little example of from the scene with the controllers visible. And so hopefully you can see some of the techniques I was just talking about. And we've been fighting to survive ever since. We are not part of their little uprising because androids have independent cores. But that just means we're targeted along with the humans. Section lords can't take over ships. Your Nexus core is in charge. Why is she letting this happen? So there you go. Um, so yeah, general, 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 uh, uh, general advice for the animating. Um, obviously, shared rigs are very, very useful. It's very um, expensive if every character has to have their own animation set, um, and it's often really unnecessary. I try not to animate things that I, I try not to animate things that look like other things. Um, in general, is is one of my rules. I don't want to animate many idle animations, unless there's some reason why an idle animation looks different to another one. Like if, if it's literally a character standing there, why do I want to make a second variant? Oh, he can stand with his little bit more weight on the left leg. It's like, I mean, that works in AAA and was obviously something I have done in larger studios, but when I'm wor working, on my, uh, working by myself, I don't have enough time or resources to, um, to allocate to that kind of thing. And it's also a very good way of getting characters in, in working fast. Something I ran into though with on Cactus was realizing that some characters had different rigs. Um, for instance, uh, Lemon, the character with the yellow hair, uh, has um, a, a ponytail um, that Cactus doesn't have. And so for the animations where I wanted her to reuse a Cactus animation, but um, it didn't have her ponytail, I found it was actually really easy to go back and just add the object in as a proxy object and animate it because in Unity at least, it will just find the hierarchy. So it's very easy to have animations that contain bones that aren't in other animations. And in pretty much every engine I've used, there's always been a way to do it. Sometimes you have a manual uh, lookup table, other times it's, it's by index, but it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where you can be a lot more flexible with how you build animations as well. You don't have to feel, oh, well, this rig is slightly different. It's like, well, maybe the rig can cater to both. Um, and yeah, and that kind of comes back to making sure that the animations you do make are unique and are interesting and are exciting. Um, I tend to have this, this feeling that like, if you, if you want to make four variant animations, you're going to basically make that, you're splitting your quality and your effort that you could have put into one animation across four. And so you have to know that's worth something or that's essential. If you're just doing it out of convention or out of the fact that people say that you should have more variations, maybe you're wasting your time and maybe you'd be better off putting that energy into that one variant that looks good and solid and just ticks all the boxes. Because a lot of the time people aren't going to notice that you have multiple idle animations, but they will notice you have a cool animation where they jump out and flip kick a helicopter. So, you know, why not spend more time animating that? Um, which. And uh, so the other thing that I run into and is very important on, uh, idle, uh, on indie projects is sometimes you've got, you're working on an animation and it's not good and it's gone, everything's gone a bit sideways. And it's like, how do you salvage that? Sometimes the correct way is to walk away from the animation, just start over. Um, but generally, you know, sometimes you just need to beat an animation back into shape or figure out a way to get it working again quickly. And my general approach, which I even used on the examples when I was making this talk, was to look at the animation. Your, big, your, your biggest tool is your eyes, um, getting that animator eye in and being able to look at motion and, and judge whether something feels off. Um, and then once you catch that something feels off, narrow down on what feels off about it. Sometimes you'll be right, sometimes you'll be wrong. It's part of the learning process. And in general, I start by kind of getting rid of, uh, rid of kinks. So I'll go through the animation and something that's just feeling a bit weird and feeling a bit wrong, I'll try to just smooth that animation right back. Generally, I'll go in and I'll make sure these are the keyframes that are okay, this is the bit that I think is suspect. And so I'll go and I'll just kill all the keyframes in between those, those good keyframes. And um, sometimes I have to use uh, Euler filtering um, to fix, if you ever have a, a 
if you ever have uh, curves that rotate all the way around, like they go from, uh, you know, ha uh, hopefully, hopefully people recognize this thing, but um, sometimes you can get curves that will snap around. So you have a character moving their hand from here to here, and instead they kind of do this. <laughs> uh, using a using an Euler filter, it varies depending on the animation package. It's very useful because it'll fix up those kind of discontinuity errors and hopefully get you back to something that's quite smooth. And once you've got something that's smooth, it might not look right, but it gives you something you can build upon again. And so like kind of killing those bad areas and being able to retime things is essential to fixing an animation that is otherwise starting to go a bit sideways. Um, retiming aggressively is really important. Don't be subtle. Don't try to fix things by one frame fixes. Look at it as a whole. Look at it uh, holistically and try to fix what's wrong with it. Is it momentum? Is it weight? Is it, is it just feeling wrong? Is it communicating wrong? Like um, thinking back to all of those earlier things about the philosophy of the movement. What is, you know, is the animation even communicating what it needs to right now? And sometimes the solution is actually fairly simple, but the problem is identifying the problem. So once you realize it just doesn't feel strong enough or it just doesn't feel weighty enough or it feels too weighty for this character, they're supposed to be spry and agile, that gives you something you can actually fix. You can, um, you can start going, well, okay, if they, spend, if they spend less time in the crouch, they'll feel less weighty, so I'll just pull that back. And you want to make these big changes and, and get results on the screen before you can continue. Um, and that's, kind of a, that's also the kind of key part of this, is like get the foundations right before you start layering on extra, extra detail, because it's just ultimately the fastest way to work. Um, the final thing that I hadn't really covered so much is that animations are generally built out of actions. I don't know exactly what the, if there's a better terminology for this, but often when I'm looking at animation, I'll realize that it, native, uh, it kind of naturally falls into having multiple, like multiple states. Imagine a character turns around and then they point at someone. There's two actions, the turn and the point. But the thing is, sometimes these, these things can be combined or separated. So naturally, you could have a character that turns around and points in one motion, and it's like that's, an, that's taken two actions and turned it into one action. Or you could realize that, no, no, this is feeling confused. This is feeling difficult for me to follow. I definitely need them to turn around and face and then point. And that's a really simple example. But like a, a better example might be uh, a character that draws back to throw a punch. And it's kind of like, you know, action one, action two. And you can think, well, no, no, I don't have enough time to, to let this character really settle into their drawback punch and throw it. So you could kind of end up combining it into some sort of like, uh, you know, oof, it's like very slow there, but like almost like a kind of martial arts or airbender style kind of flow through motion. And it's these, these kind of decisions are really crucial to, 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 to the speed and the pacing of your animation as well. Sometimes you have too many actions, sometimes you have too few. Uh, generally, if your animation feels too rushed, too few actions, if it's feeling uh, too crowded or too bitsy, too many. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how it relates to other physical activities. Uh, like uh, a lot of the time you want muscle groups to work together, which naturally combines actions. And it's a similar kind of way. And so it kind of ties back into that whole expert amateur um, dichotomy. And yeah, so it's, again, part of the whole, whole philosophy. And uh, so kind of the, um, an appropriate place to kind of settle on is when it does come to polishing your animation, when it comes to you've got an animation that works correctly, that feels solid, how do you ship it, basically? How do you get it ready to go in the game and potentially not touch it again, which is kind of the defining philosophy of first pass, final pass. Um, and generally, once I've got an animation that I'm happy with working, the stuff that I focus on first is uh, foot and hand contacts, because that makes a, that makes an animation read as solid as possible, um, and also uh, lurching and weight shift. So if a character has to shuffle their feet, make sure that they're moving their hips to accommodate the the weight shift, and that'll do a lot to signal that the character is alive and has working muscles. Um, another quick polish tip is looking for curve motion. So if a character is moving their arms, if the character is making a big swing, if a character is doing a kick, 
um, all of those things should, by animation principles, travel in arcs. Um, and sometimes, even if the animation reads okay to your eyes, if you put on, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, trajectories, um, if you turn on a trajectory tool so that you can, you can see frame by frame where the, the limb is going, you might notice there's a kink or a discontinuity or it's kind of, it'll go dut, 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 And those things are often easy to fix and will just give your animation a smoothness or a kind of niceness that they lacked before, even if they were functional. Um, the other, other big payoff I've generally find, especially for anything that's about impacts or landings or sudden motions, is adjusting curve types to make sure you kind of don't give the game away uh, with your interpolated keys. So imagine a character hitting the ground, uh, they may need to lose that momentum very, very rapidly, if not instantly, if they're hitting hard enough. Uh, and so that means changing the, the, the root key node to having a, either a, a linear key change, where it kind of comes in sharp and then leaves immediately like that, or changing it so that all the, uh, that's very small, like if you've got bezier candles, you're going to bring them right in so that you have a very, very sharp deceleration and a, a much more gentle overflow for the next key. Um, and those kind of things can really help with, imagine a character getting socked with a two by four. Uh, you don't want them to start anticipating the spin around animation until they get hit. So those kind of things just, they don't affect the, the fundamental of the animation, but they do a lot to make an animation look cleaner in the final result, and they're fairly easy to do. So again, they kind of get included in that hasty polish pass. And then finally, when you do get, do find yourself all this time to add hair animation, secondary thing, flapping stuff, smears. Um, all of this stuff goes so much better onto an animation that already works. Uh, so fundamentally, the fastest way to do really polished animation is to have something solid and something that's been gameplay tested, something that works in game, and something you're happy with from the beginning. You should be able to have an animation that does its job without any of its effects, and then those effects on top will just sit so much nicer. And honestly, that's been the, the fastest way for me to work and to do nice animation as well. And uh, thank you. I'm running a little bit fast, but that's, I think, OK. Um, thank you very much. That's my talk. Uh, so do we, uh, I think we a bit of time for questions. Uh, uh, anyone? Yeah. Anyone have a question? Uh, yep. Just wanted to know your opinion on uh, negotiating with production about or well, producers about purpose. So in that example of um, having the same rigs for all your characters, if a producer came to you and said, "Oh, you know, they're different characters. We want different rigs," how do you go about that negotiation from a purpose point of view? Uh, I mean, it really comes down to if they're different characters. Like, uh, if they if they physically have different proportions, then that's that's just a requirement, um, and that's that's fine. And same with like artistic intent. Uh, I guess I mostly see that as a when people do it as an afterthought. Um, they they create different rigs because they just go, well, we've got five characters, we've got five rigs, and without really thinking, like, is that five rigs, or or are you just kind of making more work for yourself? Um, it also completely depends on scope. Uh, if you have a project where you have five characters and they all have different body types and it's very important that they communicate uniquely, um, then that's just your game and that's, that's a good thing. But if you're, an indie, if you're doing an indie project and, you're, and you've got like skeletons and orcs and, uh, and goblins, you need, need to think really hard, do they actually have to have different physical dimensions or could I make do with a few different key poses? That, that's, the, that's kind of part of that. It really comes back to yeah, scope and, and whether you can afford it. Uh, yep. Uh, so there's they're, they're, so it was yeah facial bone, facial bones versus blend shapes. Um, I I like I mean I've worked with both of them and they're both very useful depending on the. Um, uh, depending on the topic, they have different strengths. Facial bones can go between different rigs, so that's very useful in that sense, while blend shapes generally have to be prepared per model. Um, if you have simple animation requirements, blend shapes can often give you a better performance for a small number of, um, a small number of actions. Up until recently, I say recently, it's like been like 
five years or something like that. Uh, blend shapes weren't as readily supported in recent engines like uh, um, Unity, but they have pretty good blend support, blend shape support now, so that's not an issue. It generally comes down to like what you're doing, and you can also combine them. So you can have corrective blend shapes. So you have uh, a jawbone that controls the face, but then you use a corrective blend shape to control the eye squeeze and um, you know secondary actions. And so sometimes they can go together. And realistically, like it's about what will get the job done quickest and to the best quality. So yeah, I think both are viable approaches, and it's just about picking the the correct tool for the job. Uh, Yep. Um, how do you um, visualize your animation when a lot of it is being controlled by the controller itself? So, um, for example, like, what are some tips for actually like visualizing it? Yeah, that's a good. It's <laughs> a good question. So the question was visualize visualizing animation when it's controlled by gameplay. I guess is like, yeah. Uh, I mean, because that's a, that's an interesting one. Falling, technically, you go okay. So you fall at this rate, but the game engine does that. You just animate them falling on the spot. Um, in the past, I've sometimes, depending on the action, I've set up, uh, uh, and depending on the software package, I've set up proxy bones that can move the character in approximately how they will in game, but can be turned off. Uh, depending on your workflow, you might export with, um, see, because falling animation should be controlled by the engine, so you don't even want that to be a, a root motion kind of thing. But yeah, so I've I've done ones before where I've I've set up proxy bones to to simulate the motion that I can then turn off before exporting. Uh, other times it's just kind of getting used to it or iterating. Uh, especially if you're exporting and then checking directly in engine, you have a lot of ability to do something, chuck it into game, see what it looks like, change it, and iterate like that. Um, it seems a little bit slower, but it's also good for getting your eye in and understanding the gameplay because sometimes you change an animation and it makes you realize the game is going to need to be a little bit different. Um, or, you, you know, there's an action and it just, with, with an actual animation in there, you realize it's going to take longer for that action to read. And that reflects back to gameplay. Sometimes gameplay is immutable, other times it can take that on board. Um, and so, yeah, it's a bit of practice. Sometimes I set up proxy bones. Uh, for run cycles, I generally have a piece of terrain that I've got like either a looping texture or a or is moving and then snapping back into position, so I can check foot falls and make sure it like reads right. Um, it's I, kind of whatever works, I guess. But yeah, it is a it is a tricky thing, and it requires you thinking gameplay and animation at the same time. Uh, yep. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Reference is, reference is super good. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not appropriate, depending on, you know, if you're doing like a, a orc smashing something into the air, it's like, yeah, it's a little bit imaginary. Um, like the parkour animations, um, I, yeah, I definitely, like, I look up videos of people parkouring, and it kind of ends up being an amalgamation, because it's like, you rarely find exactly motion. But capturing stuff like, what does a human body look like when it's flying through the air? It's like, I don't know. Um, acting stuff out in mirrors and uh, videotaping yourself is also good, uh, especially for subtle animation. If you're doing someone like having a conversation and you just want to get hand gestures down, doing a short video of yourself gives you some keyframes to work off and it's really, really good because getting strong keyframes kind of is half the battle and yeah, it's uh, definitely useful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, change weight animations, in particular, are one of the more like easiest things to get wrong. Like this, because it's so subtle, and we're so used to it, and it's so weight and you know realism driven. It's hard to imagine because it's not exciting. <laughs> and if you get it wrong, it reads as it reads as fake. So yeah, it's one of those ones that's that's a case. And that's actually a case like I you know mocap has a is really good at capturing everyday animations because one it gets the subtleties, and two, nobody really wants to animate that, do they? But it's like, yeah. But yeah, reference is quite good for that as well. Uh, yep? So uh, I find it really interesting when you talk about shared rigs and trying to manage like diversity of content against the amount of time you have. And when you talked about having one character who didn't have a ponytail and the other one who did, and you could, after the fact, once you finish your rig and done the animation, add have you, like, have you ever been in a situation where you're kind of, you want to 
to add more diversity of content to a project, but you feel very tied to the route that you have already. And have you been in a position where you, like, you weren't sure if that was viable? And then, and then like, did it, did you, like, I guess I'm kind of trying to work out how can you manage your workflow once you go off, off track? Yeah, I mean, I guess at one point it starts feeding into itself. Um, so, um, like, it's not about, you don't get to the end of the project and go, I really want to do this thing. You start thinking about what can I do with what I've got. Um, sorry, I'm not sure that makes sense. So, so it's un unlikely that you'd be working with a shared rig through the project and get to the end and say, oh no, now I really need to do this one thing. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, you're more likely to start thinking at the end, or oh, what could I do easily? What could, I could add an extra robot arm to this character and it's just animate for the three animations that it needs. Um, personally, I always like to do things that look like they shouldn't be possible. I'm, I'm really a big fan of using animation in unconventional ways that makes, you know, pull off of cool effects and people go, how are you doing that? So that's just a canned animation. It's like, it just, of course it looks like physics, but it's okay. Um, and same with characters, you know, how is that character doing that unique thing? It's like, oh, I just added an extra proxy bone, like, why not? Um, it's, I guess you get creative at the end, but it's, it's not about feeling limited, it's about feeling like finding potential in your own limitations, if that makes sense. Sorry, there was one more question. Uh, yep. Um, I'm kind of curious about, we were talking about dynamic animation, yep. um, how do you work with the programmers and the engineers? Kind of what was the Yeah, so when I worked on larger teams, obviously with programmers and for that, I tended to be the animator that worked closely with programmers. Um, I took a lot of interest in it. I would uh, sit behind a particular programmer and argue about the blending times because I had a real, like I wanted it to look a certain way. And that's where a lot of this, because now I do my own programming, so I get to argue with myself. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, when I was working on larger teams, that communication was crucial. You need to you need the programmers on board. You need the programmers to understand that you have a shared objective to make the game better. And so a lot of that comes down to just, um, yeah, communicating clearly, explaining what you need. Um, I've had cases where I got programmers excited, so it's about to wrap up, but I, programmers excited about um, the animations I made, which made them then prioritize implementing them to get them in game because they wanted to be heroes as well. And was, that was the best feeling, that, that feeling of kind of mutual, you know, I make the programmers look good, the programmers make me look good, everyone high fives. Um, and so sometimes it's just about communicating clearly what you're trying to do because ultimately what you're trying to do should be good for the game and everyone wants what's good for the game. That's at least, at least my opinion. And on that, I think we're gonna uh, leave it there. And thank you so much for coming.